So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you'll notice a sort of younger version of me. This is uh, the very first summer school, was the last time I was here. That was 13 years ago. So um, obviously there's been a bit... You look the same. Uh, <laughs> well, the next speaker is there. You see, and uh, well look, at least Branko's lost some weight. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> right. Um, the previous speakers, I mean both yesterday but particularly today, have been extremely helpful in setting the groundwork. So I'm going to begin and end with five questions. Okay, so at the moment, you know, you don't know enough really to answer those questions, but hopefully by the end we can have a discussion <laughs> about that. Um, so you can either try and answer the questions or ask your own questions. Okay, so that's, that's sort of where we're heading. So what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about poor scale modeling and imaging, but actually mainly the imaging, mainly the experiments, actually there's going to be very little modeling here. So what's new is even 13 years ago, we started using uh, X-ray microscopes to look inside rocks, and we weren't the first group to do this. Um, but now we can do it really well, let's put it this way. So that's the first thing. And then we have really good software as well. And the way in which we develop software is is very different. We have public domain software, we share things, we adapt things for what we want. So what I'm going to do is we're going to be doing some sort of traditional looking experiments um, to measure properties in the way that's been described earlier today, um, and imaging and some modeling to try and understand or characterize multi-phase flow, and in our case, principally in rocks over a variety of scales. And the main applications that we're going to have, so INSA introduced some new applications. My main applications are really going to be oil recovery, so getting oil and gas out of the ground, and CO2 storage, so putting CO2 in the ground. Less on hydrology, okay, so slightly different application. So just to place this in context, so here are the two things. How much oil do we recover? Right, this is a traditional equation. It's basically, well, how much oil we have underground, then we normally inject something like water to push the oil out, and that water doesn't go everywhere. But where the water does go, how much of the oil do we displace? And that's essentially what we're going to look at, okay? This sort of displacement efficiency that's controlled by what's happened at the, happening at the pore scale. Now, traditionally, in reservoir engineering, this is something we measure. And the measurement is in itself a sort of billion dollar a year industry, but it's just something you measure and put in a model, and that's it. What we want to do is we want to understand it so we can manipulate it, so we can change it, so you can improve recovery, just as we do with this one. This is basically where you drill the wells. So we got very clever at putting wells in the right place. Um, we're still pretty stupid about what we inject. The same is if we want to um, put CO2 underground, so we collect the CO2, we place it underground so it doesn't go into the atmosphere. We want to store as much, so it's sort of the opposite. We don't, with oil, we want to get it out. With CO2, we want to keep it in. So we want actually to design a process where actually the displacement efficiency of CO2 is as low as possible. So we keep as much underground, okay? So that's, that's where we're heading. So what can we do? We have a lab. Okay, that's looking at fluid flow. So if you look at this picture, this looks a bit like a medical CT scanner. That's because it is a medical CT scanner. And so, you know, we can look at sort of people size, or up to people size pieces of rock. So we can look at sort of the average saturations within it and something about rock texture. Um, and that's sort of, one might say, traditional. But that doesn't tell us what's happening at the pore scale. So to look in the pore scale, we take a piece of rock, there's something between five to 13 millimetres across. We're going to wrap it in various things here, but what we're doing is we're going to reproduce the high temperatures and pressures that we see underground, and then we're going to do fluid flow experiments. And this is an X-ray microscope, and we're going to take three-dimensional images of the rock and the fluids within them. Okay. So let's have a picture of this. Um, this is a sort of preparing for Brexit. I don't know why the student <laughs> looked at a, an English penny, so no one has any idea of uh, how big that is. But I've just said, <laughs> right, this is a small sample. It's actually it's, uh, up to about five millimetres across. And actually, we can have samples that are a few centimetres longer, so a little bit longer than shown here. Yeah, so it's a giant penny. Right. <laughs> OK, and then what we do, 
Two things is we're going to wrap this rock because we're going to reproduce high temperatures and pressures, and we're going to put it in a carbon fiber sleeve that enables us to impose high pressures, but it's strong, but it's x-ray transparent. That's, that's the key. Okay? And we also have a heating jacket so we can control the heat, the temperature, which is rather critical. So basically this is what we have. We have the rock and a flow cell, which is in the x-ray enclosure. And then we have our pumps that can do various things. Here we're looking at CO2 storage. So we're injecting CO2 and brine that actually lies outside the scanner. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's all lead lined, so this is opened up when it's not actually working. Um, but this is the X-ray source. It sends X-rays through here. This is an X-ray camera, essentially. And this rotates. You take lots and lots of projections, and then you reconstruct a three-dimensional image. And this is when it's sort of working in anger. Right, you put the source actually very close to the rock. That's how you get high resolution. So it's x-rays. There's no real problem with resolution in principle. You just need to get the x-rays close to the sample. OK. OK, we can also, this is great because we have the instruments in our own lab. So we can, you know, do long experiments. The problem is not very quick because you have fluid flow but each image takes an hour or two to acquire. It's going to be a good quality image. If you want to look at dynamic processes, you need a brighter source of x-rays. So this is a synchrotron source. Okay. Here are the x-rays going in. Right, the x-rays are so powerful, they're actually ionizing the air. Um, if you were in the room at the time, you'd probably be dead within a second, but you're not. This is a remote camera, of course. Uh, so uh, it is actually, <laughs> it looks unsafe, but it is safe. Okay, so. We have a team that uh, look at dynamic tomography. So what are we doing? So here are just some two-dimensional pictures of rocks that we study. Right, we're going to look at the fluids in, in, the bit, in the bit. So we've got the benchtop micro CT scanners. We've got synchrotron sources. And then, as I said, I'm not going to talk too much about the modeling. But the modeling here, our idea is not fancy computers, but actually to think a little bit more carefully about what the algorithms are. Right? And then, as I said, some great public domain software that we don't necessarily use blindly, but we can adapt to our, our uh, needs. OK, now we're going to get into the sort of science of this. And uh, thankfully, Danny gave a beautiful introduction to this. So you know, now know something about contact angle. So, and we also know something about pore structure. And in fact, Danny showed a picture with a sort of idealized triangle. So let's talk about this. So we're going to be looking deep underground. And most rock deep underground is saturated with water, actually saturated with brine. And it is naturally water wet, OK? Because you have a silica or a carbonate surface, for instance. But then over geological time, oil might migrate into the reservoir. And crude oil is a mixture of thousands of different chemical components. And some of them are surface active, which basically means they stick to the surface. OK, so you can imagine, basically, there's some oil that sticks to the surface. And what that does, it alters the wettability. It makes it, to use um, Danny's terminology, hydrophobic. We would call it oil wet. It likes oil, right, because it's an oily surface. OK, so when you now inject water to displace oil, you now find that the oil is non-wetting. Sorry, the water is non-wetting, what am I talking about? The water is non-wetting to the oil. The oil actually likes the surface and clings to the surface in these layers. And the contact angle that quantifies that wettability is basically this angle here. Okay? And that contact angle doesn't have to be zero, doesn't have to be 180, as we're going to show. It can more or less be everything in between. And then what we want to know is we want to know about fluid flow. We want to know how much oil we get out of the ground or how much CO2 we store. And that's going to be governed by the displacement, what we inject, um, the pore structure, of course, but also this wettability, right? also this contact angle. OK, so here are the equations. And in fact, INSA quite nicely said this. Right? The difference maybe between what we've seen before is we have Darcy's law, but we need to consider the, f the flow not just of water, but of oil. And if we've got gas as well, gas. So the Darcy law, the multi-phase Darcy law, now has relative permeabilities of more than one phase. So we're not just interested in the water flow, but the oil flow or CO2. So that's the first thing that's maybe a little bit different. The second thing is capillary pressure. It's traditionally in the oil industry defined as the pressure difference between the oil and the water. 
When it's an air water system, it's been assumed, you know, Reen's talk uh, this morning, was that that's just always positive. Okay? Um, but of course, we've changed the wettability now. So here we have an example where oil goes into a rock. Now we displace it with water, and you can see the capillary pressure here goes negative. You actually have to push the water in to displace the oil. So this, this capillary pressure can be negative. And in fact, as I've said, I'm not convinced that real soils with organic materials <laughs> don't have negative capillary pressures as well. And the last point, which Insa mentioned, was we're interested in recovery, so volume, but we normally don't talk about water content, we normally talk about saturation. So we're going to look at everything as a function of saturation, okay? And traditionally it's water saturation, actually, okay? So that's, those are the differences. Okay, so what are the physical processes that occur? Basically, two fundamental principles, two fundamental things. One is straight water flooding, where you have a piece of rock. I have a well with pumps, and I push water through the rock to displace the oil. That's hopefully straightforward. The other process we see in fractured media, but Danny also demonstrated is exactly the same process as when he dipped a tissue into water, is called spontaneous imbibition. And where, where this occurs underground is I have a fractured medium, I inject water, the water basically just goes through the fractures. So it's a short circuit. But then, You've got rock here that may contain all the oil, or most of the oil, and the water moves into the rock simply by capillary action, and the oil moves out. So exactly the same as the water soaking into the tissue. The only difference is the air we don't really worry about. Here, water moves in, oil moves out. Okay? Right. So, what do we get? I call this the trillion barrel question. The reason is, there's about a trillion barrels of conventional oil in the world, most of it in carbonate reservoirs, most of it in the Middle East. And those fields are getting a little bit more mature. So if you inject water to displace the oil, how much are we going to get out? Well, here are measurements of relative permeability. These are very difficult measurements to make. And the dotted lines are where, actually, I inject oil to displace water. So I'm not so interested in that, because that's what I sort of have originally. And then what I do is I inject water to displace oil. But these are real reservoir samples. The oil is stuck to the surface. They're sort of mixed or oil wet. Okay? So this is textbook stuff. This is the dashed lines. If it's oil wet, then the oil clings to the little nooks and crannies, rather than being in the big pores, so the oil relative permeability is low. The water relative permeability is high, because now the water is non-wet and goes through the big pores and flows readily. So this is textbook stuff. What it means is the recovery is bad, and the reason is when the water saturation is sort of less than 50%, if I have that saturation at a well, I'm producing 50% oil and 50% water get to a higher saturation, I'm producing mainly water from my well, not oil. That's not economically beneficial. So basically, this is bad news. I don't get, I inject the water, the water goes through the big pores, it's non-wetting, I retain all the oil in the pore space. But those are three measurements, the other six the other way around. There's been a wettability alteration, I'm going to show that in a bit. In fact, the oil relative permeability is low, but so is the water relative permeability. And so this means the crossover point is much higher. You're getting more oil out. You're getting, you know, 10 or 15% more oil out. Why is that? Okay, so that's a, that's a question. Okay, can we design a process so that we're here rather than here? And then, I, I'm not going to talk about unconventionals today, but there, the uncertainties are huge. Let's look at another thing. Let's look at imbibition. We've just seen that process, right? Basic lecture theatre stuff. Mm -mm. Now I'm going to say something a bit more controversial. Actually we don't really understand this. So here are the governing equations. Okay, for flow entirely controlled by capillary forces. It's only been recently noticed that you can more or less solve those equations analytically. Okay, so what happens? We know this from the Washburn equation. The amount by which you imbibe scales as root t. So we have a scaling factor, which is distance over root t. Okay. So these are some analytic solutions. Right? Saturation versus this sort of diffusion parameter. So here are 
various mobility ratios, this is Brooke Corey capillary pressure. Reen also presented his model, right? The Van Genuchten model. The Van Genuchten model gives a completely different behavior. Why? Because the Van Genuchten model, I know it's a good match to the data, it has an infinite slope of the capillary pressure when the relative permeability goes to zero. So it's infinity times zero, which in this particular case equals infinity. It actually gives you an infinite diffusion coefficient. So the water moves in without there being any change in saturation. Whereas any other model gives you a finite slope, and in fact you can even have an infinite slope. Now, so the Van der model model's been around for a long time. Okay? Certainly matches data, I'm not doubting that. I'm not so interested in matching the data. I wanted to match the phenomenology. But you say, well, this is basic stuff, I mean, for goodness sake, right? Just soaking in, so we know what the answer is. I'm now going to tell you which model is right, right? And these are qualitative differences. They're not subtle little things. I don't know. We've done some experiments, but, you know, they were on a dry piece of rock, and they were inconclusive, and this and that. We don't know. Okay? So, talked to the first, first day with John Selker, said, you know, look at some problems, try and work out what's going on. You look at fluid flow, most of you being hydrologists would use Green's model, nothing wrong with it, it's a good match to data, right? Does it give you the right phenomenology? Yeah. Uh, why can't you change the Van der Luten parameters? Uh, okay, if you use the traditional M is one. One, one, then you get this. If you keep those two independent, it's true because you have an infinity times a finite, and then that will give you zero. So basically, <laughs> normally you'd either get this, this is the basic model, okay, I don't want to overdo it, or you're going to get something that's more like this. So yes, it's something we can observe. So let's have a look at it. Right? So I'm, I'm leaving this open deliberately, right? I'm not, I'm not going to now tell you the answer. But here are some basic things in our subject that we're not, we haven't really, <laughs> haven't really looked at that well. We see two things that are interesting. One is we inject oil, then we change the wettability, and we get some water in the corners that essentially pin there. It can't move. And that's the origin of that low water relative permeability that gives you good oil recovery. You inject water, and the water goes through these narrow layers, but they can't really move. The second thing that gives you good oil recovery is the oil is in this layer, right, sandwiched between water in the corners and water in the centre, and that oil is continuous. So the oil remains continuous and can flow. OK, that's fine. Whoops. Uh, uh. Now, I'm having difficulty with this. So it's not working. Oh, yes, it is. OK. But what about, we talked about wettability. What are we actually seeing in terms of contact angle? So here is um, just a zoom through, so a nice, cool 3D picture of an experiment. This is just clever image processing, OK? There's nothing. So that's the trapped, in this case, it's trapped CO2 in the pore space. So those are the blobs of CO2. This is about a millimetre across, by the way. OK. So the different colours are simply you know, the different trap blobs. So we've already established they're trapped in the pore space. But what about the wettability? What about that contact angle? Right? Because that's fundamentally uh, should be controlling the behaviour. So we've just taken a particular blob. Okay, we're sort of looking at the raw image, CO2 brine rock. Okay, there's the CO2 brine rock. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to identify the three-phase contact line where the two phases, fluid phases, hit the solid. That's shown in yellow. Then what we do is we take a plane that's perpendicular to the three-phase contact line. Okay. Done it. Okay. Okay, it zooms around just, uh, just to be fancy. <laughs> Doesn't have to do this. Okay. So now we have it. This is the rock. This is the brine. This is the contact angle through the CO2. Traditionally, you measure it actually through the water. So traditionally, 45 degrees. So it's actually water wet. The water likes the surface. But it's not, a, it's not an angle of zero. Right? And there's a variation in angle. And so, OK, fair enough. CO2 is non-wetting in the presence of brine on a rock surface. Hmm, so what? Now let's look at our reservoir samples. So 
This is quite nice. These are reservoir samples from Abu Dhabi, so from producing oil field. They've been aged in crude oil. And now we see something different, right? When they've been aged in crude oil, the oil is in the nooks and crannies and layers, and the water, because it's non-wetting, is in the big pores. So we're not, the oil is not trapped in the big pores like it was before, so it's clearly um, not water wet. The other thing, in case you think, and you might be right in this, oh yeah, uh, sort of oil industry stuff, so it's all, you know, top secret. You know, so Martin gives this presentation and then you can't find anything. We have managed to get, ad hoc, to agree to put all of the images and all of the codes I'm going to show that have been analysing the images in the public domain. Okay, so it's there for anyone to look at. So, we can measure the contact angles. What do we see? Now, I don't have time to go through what people would have expected, but I'll tell you, it's not what people expected. So, we've got <laughs> three samples. One, we didn't really age at all. So, it sort of saw the crude oil and we did the experiment. And that's what we're going to call water wet. So, when we measure the contact angle on a flat calcite surface with exactly the same system, we get a contact angle of about 76 degrees. When we look at the contact angles in situ on a rough surface, we see a distribution about that average. OK, uncontroversial, really. The other two have been aged in two different oils. Right, so this one I'm going to call mixed wet because the average contact angle is almost exactly 90 degrees with a distribution about it. This one is a bit more oil wet, so it's sort of shifted to the oil repellent side. There's a wide distribution of angle. And when we measure the contact angles on a flat surface at exactly the same conditions, these aren't the middle, they're here, they're at the end. Now, if you remember Danny's talk, talked about Cassie wetting, right? Cassie Baxter model, Wenzel wetting. So if you have a rough surface that's oil wet, you roughen it up, it gets more oil wet. So you'd expect, measure this on a flat surface, on a rough surface, the distribution is bang here. Mm -mm, it's not what you see. That's another question. Why is that? Well, something to think about, something to discuss. Okay? I, <laughs> I have my ideas, but we only got so much time. Okay? Then you see some correlations, which is sort of what you expect. Don't, don't worry about this crazy equation, it's a bit weird. But what we do is we can also measure surface roughness, which basically is you look at the deviation from a smooth surface locally. Right, so how, how up and down is the surface, okay? And we've also measured roughness and contact angles. So we look at the correlation between those measurements as a function of the distance between them. So one means no correlation. So after about a pore size, right, they're unrelated. But within a pore size, it's not a strong correlation, but there's a tendency for rougher surfaces to be more water wet, less strongly non-wetting, which is exactly sort of what you've seen before. You've got this distribution that's pushed the contact angles to be more water wet on the rough surface. So a rougher surface should be more water wet, and a, obviously a completely smooth surface, you don't see any change. So that makes sense. Right. And why is it important? Because it makes a big difference to recovery. If we have a water wet case, great for CO2 storage, oil gets trapped in the big pores, you've got this snap off, the water's in the nooks and crannies. Excellent. Terrible if it's an oil reservoir. If it's oil wet, which is actually this case, the oil is in the nooks and crannies, but actually it sort of gets stuck there. So again, the recovery is terrible. The case that's best is the mixed wet case with this broad distribution of contact angle. You've got this nice connectivity of the oil, but you've also, you've also stopped the water flowing so readily. So you've actually got the best of both worlds. So this is what you want. And again, in the oil industry, people don't think that. They think, no, whatever we do, we need to push it to be mixed wet. Sorry, water wet. But actually, it's this case that's best. Uh, you, change, you change the salinity of the water. So low salinity water flooding or surfactant flooding, a lot of what it depends on is it says we will make the rock more water wet. It doesn't necessarily give you better recovery. Okay. So this looks all uh, pretty nice. This morning I actually found, as well as the uh, pictures of us on the beach, 
<laughs> I found my presentation from 13 years ago. So I won't bore you with the other future work, which as usual we didn't really do. 13 years ago, I ended my talk saying, we should look at mixed wet me media where we do little flow experiments so we can see the pore size as well as doing all the measurements. We did that for the first time last week. Okay, <laughs> so you know it's not easy, right? Okay, so we have done this. I'm gonna, I, I want to have some time for questions. So we can do this. We can do these little steady state experiments. This is actually just the water wet one because we haven't actually analysed the mixed wet one. Um, but what we can now measure is we measure a pressure drop and the saturation. This gives us the relative permeability, and we can measure the curvature, and that gives us the capillary pressure. In this case, it's all you know, a bit like uh, Reen showed earlier, positive capillary, this is drainage imbibition, okay? So we can do these miniature experiments. So, that's where I'm going to end, okay? Um, I have one slide, just a quick, uh, whoops, acknowledgement, because obviously I get a lot of money from the oil industry, right? I've been very generously funding this, so I'm not, uh, not complaining. I've also got, written, I'm plugging my book, but that was written last year, so things have moved on. Okay, so uh, we have more to say. But let's end with these questions. Okay, so if anyone wants to advance an answer, that would be great. Or if you want to ask your own questions, you're welcome to do so. So, thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned that a third of the CO2 gets trapped. What about the other two thirds? What happens to that? Okay. Oh, okay, so the way of thinking about it is like this, okay? So, this is the pore space, say, filled with CO2. Water moves in, okay? You're right, the other two thirds moves, okay? But then it keeps moving. It doesn't move that far. So what happens is you get this plume of CO2 deep underground, and it may extend many kilometres, but these you know, regional aquifers extend hundreds of kilometres. As it moves, it leaves behind this trail of trapped CO2, and eventually it stops moving. So that's the idea. You can then work out at the macro scale how far the CO2 will move before it's all trapped. Yeah. Uh, what was that? Uh, I'm interested in your uh, estimation of curvature, uh, roughness system, like that. But given the fact that the reconstruction is a boxed based system, do you have an idea of the accuracy of those uh, estimates? Yes, so, okay. <laughs> You're right, so it's a voxel-based image. What we do is we artificially smooth, and we know that the, we, <laughs> we hypothesize that the all-water curvature should be constant, so we try and make it a constant curvature. If we do it on synthetic images, where we say voxelize a sphere, then we get a curvature measurement to within about 10%, as long as the radius is <coughs> two or more voxels across, so it's actually pretty good. When we look at a real image, the problem is near the three-phase contact line. So we find if we look at the curvature away from any of the contacts, it's pretty good, but near the contacts, it tends to get distorted, and there's some very good reasons for that. So here we're looking at the curvatures, certainly in the, the last example, we're looking at the curvatures that are about 30 microns, and we up to 30 microns, actually, let's be honest. The radius of curvature is 30 microns. The voxel size is 2 microns, so I think we're okay for that. I think we're getting it to within a few percent. And it, it's consistent with other measurements, actually, to within that sort of error. Someone is like the last question, though. This is the model for uh, in the region. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm a bit uh, surprised that you put so much weight on the Van Gerwen model. He's not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just as well, are we? <laughs> no, no, I'm just showing... No, I mean, I'm not... No, the, reason, the reason I'm saying this is because We've been uh, in that situation a long time ago in uh, soil about inhibition of water into dry soil. But there are formulations of the, of the diffusivity function that are not necessarily, they don't have to be tied uh, intimately to the, uh, to the capillary pressure saturation relationship. And, and so the fact that you, that you insist to derive it from the capillary pressure relationship is already a flaw in the, in the representation, in my view. I, uh, 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 I agree with you. This actually is one of the problems. I agree with you if it's a dry soil. That, that's right, because the, 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 you have to establish essentially a wetting state yeah. 
right? And that's a piece of physics that's not here. I'm not convinced that it won't work for the cases I'm more interested in anyway, is where you have a rock where there's already water initially present. And in that case, I don't see why a continuum model actually shouldn't work in principle. No, but I'm talking about the parameterization. Yeah. I'm not talking, the physics is the physics, the parameterization is the issue, right? Yes, so I would say at the moment, if we're looking at a rock anyway, with an initial water present, we are not sure what is the right parameterization that will give you the right imbibition behavior. We know what parameterization matches the measured capillary pressure, that I'm not, that I'm not disputing. Yeah. Okay? But that's normally from an equilibrium. Right? So you've got some sort of saturation height yeah, relationship. Yeah, okay? This is the dynamics, and the question yeah. is what's, what's right for the dynamics? But still, it boils down to the selection of the diffusion equation. Yes. So I'm and, there, and there we have a great experience in selecting diffusion equations, not necessarily the ones that are derived from the Mangalutian, neither the one from Brooks and Poirier. So there is a whole, whole world of uh, diffusion equations, all the way from the textile industry to, to whatever, you know? I, I agree, but what, we, what I think we're lacking is not the theory. I think we're lacking the experiments. So the frustrating thing is this is, you know, you have a low permeability rock, should be able to do it slow enough. We don't, and the shape of the curve tells you, I mean, you're exactly right, Danny. I think we're, we're saying things, the shape of the curve tells you an awful lot about what the diffusion coefficient should be, basically. It's that, that we don't have the experiments. That's why, sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be a critique of the models. It was a sort of throwing it out there, right? If you want, you know, if you're sitting, you know, what could I do that's pretty basic but important? That's an example of something, right? There is still stuff out there in this field. Right? I, mean, I, I was thinking about this, you know, you see these grey-haired guys who've been around for ages, right, talking about all this wonderful stuff, and you think, oh, there's not much for me to do. There's a lot to do, right? And very important problems to tackle as well. So John put it beautifully, right? And this is just an example, right, of thousands of things we could look at. Yes, don't misinterpret it. Those rough surfaces from a real rock still had average contact angles greater than 90. So I don't say rough surfaces are water wet. I say they are more water wet than a flat surface. Yes. In terms of contact angles. Yes, in terms of contact What's the other measure you're going to use? Inhibition or other things. Okay, so basically it's for the smooth surface, not for the rock surface. Because when it's, it's rock, then... Yeah. Is, that, is, there, is there a smooth surface? Measure, measure. Measure. Is there, <laughs> is there, is there, I mean, it's a protocol. If you want to do contact angle, your surface should be smooth. Yeah. No, okay, I'm going to be quite adamant about that. We're looking inside a rock, the surfaces aren't smooth. So looking at a smooth surface doesn't give you the contact angle inside a rock. So it is of no, it is not <coughs> lacking in value, but it isn't as valuable as looking inside. You're right, you can look at other things like how much it imbibes. And you're absolutely right to point out, as Danny said, it's a, it's a molecular object, but we're only measuring it at the scale of a few microns. Okay, so we're looking at an effective angle at that scale that's why we see a wide range, because we're not resolving all the nooks and crannies. The reason why it's more water wet actually goes back to Danny's um, energy balance. If it's a rough surface, 
in primary drainage, when the oil goes in, there's water collecting in those grooves. When I put water over water, the energy penalty is zero. So the rough surfaces retain more water, and then when water goes back over that surface, it's seeing a lot of water on water. That's the reason. Okay? I mean, it's actually relatively straightforward when you think of it that way. Okay, yeah, I didn't have time to describe that. What we do is we mesh the solid surface and we look locally and it's essentially the curvature. So we look at how curved that surface is and essentially what it is, it's like a traditional roughness actually you can do for building stone external surfaces. It's the deviation from a locally flat surface. So it's measured in microns and it's the deviation of the surface from a locally flat one. And we do that sort of on a voxel. We can do it, yeah, because we mesh the surface and we look at one point and we look at all its neighbours and we measure that that gives you a curvature and then you say, right, if I made it a plane, what would be the deviation? Yeah. 